Good afternoon, all. Thanks for joining us uh, live from the Shire and we're uh, across Sydney for the rest of the panel. Uh, hopefully, we can get through a few issues today and take you through some of the things that we are seeing, albeit where there's still a, a lot of uncertainty rolling through. Uh, we're fortunate to have a lot of our experts available um, across all aspects of our business. Uh, James McFarlane will give us an update across what's happening in the banking and debt advisory areas. Nick Guest, who's very busy in uh, mergers and acquisitions, and uh, it will tell us what's happening across there and, and driving that aspect. Andrew Ash is helping uh, a lot of our business in business advisory, particularly larger family businesses in succession and a few other issues that are arising here. And, and Matt, and, and I are working through a number of things in restructuring and, and risk uh, about how you can maximize your way out here. So we're very fortunate to have all those experts this morning. Uh, hopefully they can ask some, add some value and please ask them difficult questions because that's what they're here for. Uh, in terms of the discussion, as, we, as I sort of alluded to, we'll get through the banks and where the financial lenders are and what they're doing. We'll talk about cash flow management and what that means going forward. Uh, succession planning and exit and how that's important at the moment. Uh, the rebound and, and the build of uh, interest in M&A and then some restructuring and, and what's going on in some industries and, and some of the areas that are uh, subject to that at the moment. So to get all through that or to start that off, we need to sort of set a scene because uh, it is an interesting economy at the moment. We've come through a bounce from last year's COVID and then Delta hit and we've been subjected to a second downturn, uh, there's obviously a potential for a second bounce. The questions are, when is that going to happen and how big is it going to be and how strong will it be? So to set through that, we'll get through into some economic data, first of all. So here's GDP. Obviously, June 20 last year stands out a fair bit. It was a um, once-in-a-lifetime event. Economists are enjoying covering it and following it and testing it and looking at it. And if you look at the quarter before in March, we had a downturn as well. So um, as COVID hit in March, so that drove a technical recession last year, albeit it didn't really have an impact given the government spending that was uh, through JobKeeper and whatever else. So that then enabled this bounce and the growth to come out back out the other side, which meant we were very close to getting back to where GDP was pre-COVID, uh, coming into sort of May and June this year. However, June appears to have tightened up, albeit that COVID didn't hit until late in the quarter. So there has been a bounce. September is expected to be a big drop. And the other thing that you need to look at in June is, is that June was only 0.7% growth. And if you flick to the Ten next you one, you'll see that the majority of that growth in the investment was actually public investment during that quarter. So that indicates that private investment was down a little bit. That for a number of factors, whether that was supply of being, uh, couldn't be able to get supply or whatever else, but that was an indicator that the economy was not going as strongly in that quarter as possible. Uh, and potentially if you pull out that government investment, that it was a down quarter, that would okay. indicate that if we had a down quarter and a down quarter in September as expected, that we would have another technical recession. Does that matter? I don't think so. I think technical recessions these days don't have the same impact, particularly because of the we're in a global economy now and there's plenty of cash around. Whereas previously in recessions, the difficulty has been getting cash to be able to do things. Now, I don't think that's as big an issue. So goods businesses won't even probably feel too much of it. If we move through that, then what is the next factor? What is the next stage that's going to happen? What's going to happen in September and October quarters and then into March, uh, September and De December quarters and then into March. So September is going to be down. December is going to open up at the back end, hopefully once uh, we get into vaccination rates. So where is that impact going to roll out? So when do you think we are going to roll back out? Is it going to be a massive summer? Or is everybody going to wait until after they have a holiday in January? Or are we going to be slower next year into June? Or is it going to be even slower than that? Um, so B wins at 48%. So B and C seem to be the majority. That's 78%. That's, that's um, pretty fair and reasonable, I think. 
uh, and I get the feeling December, yeah, might be at the start, but it might be a little bit slower than last time. That's that's interesting. All right, we'll move on to the next issues, which is the more um, up-to-date statistics. And this is probably has a bigger issue going forward. Employees and people are a big issue at the moment because we are living in a limited pool of employees. We've also got employees moving, transitioning between industries, some which are closed, some which are not. Uh, and that is creating a little bit of movement. As you can see, the unemployment rate jumped last year to 7.5% and then crashed back to 45 apparently in August. However, there is a very large portion of people who are not actually working any hours, but they are accessing government support by their employment. So some economics say that the actual unemployment rate could be as high as 9%. Uh, it's very difficult to assess that and what it is, but the underemployment rate, as you can see in August, reached 9.3. And the ratios for employment are going down. And the big thing I see is the uh, monthly hours work decreased by 66 million hours in June from the previous month. Uh, sorry, in August from the previous month. So that's indicative that there is a large issue with employees um, and getting workforce right. Uh, hopefully the bounce compensates for that and, and that will just absorb all these people back into a few of these industries. But we are seeing some shortages. And this is the hourly sort of position. So you can see that the, the dump last year and then that gradually came back up in the number of hours worked and then topped out and was declining before COVID hit again or for Delta. Um, but there, is, there has been a massive decline over these three months. And we are seeing that there are issues in certain industries about getting the right staff and capacity because obviously the borders are shut, so you can't access overseas migration. Uh, there is a global shortage of auditors, which I can't understand because it's obviously a very exciting job. Um, but it's, it's difficult to get that because it is more of a global sort of economy in those aspects. And there are other certain industries which are really facing shortages as well. So um, we're also seeing that with our businesses, it, it is difficult to get people to move into new roles. It's taking longer. Uh, terms are a bit more aggressive. So that this could be a limiting factor of the second bounce until we reopen uh, on a more fully, a more full basis. Obviously, if we do open up on a more full basis and we get things like overseas students coming through, that could um, cushion some of this and, and help compensate it. Uh, but that's to be seen, it's going to be an issue going forward. So one of the other questions we had, which is the next slide, is which what what are you seeing in recruitment? Is it the same? Are you having to offer more money and spend more time to get the right person? Is it difficult? Because obviously you don't know whether you're going to need them. So whether you replace or not, um, is it easier? Some people are finding it easier because it is an interesting market for people at the moment. What do you think, Mr. Hocking? Uh, well, I mean, we've only, only talked to the accounting industry and, and there's definitely significant shortages um, in, in all of our different areas. Um, people are well aware of audit, but um, especially in, in the restructuring space, um, finding, I guess, staff at certain levels is, is almost impossible. And Ashley, what about in family businesses? Uh, I would say that um, B, I think um, clients are having to offer more money and to offer more incentives to actually get staff. I think they're actually finding it quite hard to actually find people. So the battle for talent is going to continue to get worse. 100%, yeah. So there we go, having to spend more time and it's difficult. So that's the vast majority, that's that over 80% are sitting in B and C, which indicates that uncertainty and then having to find the right people because people can be choosy at the moment in this limited market. So that, that I think indicates a restrictive sort of position. So it's gonna make it more difficult moving forward. We move into the star performance. So we've talked about Australian statistics, then we do a comparison with the world. So based off some, uh, uh, the OECD release that happened last week, and I know they've downgraded us on our growth from 5.5% to four, um, but we were one of the star performers in the bounce from COVID uh, compared to the rest of the OECD. Uh, eradication really worked well for us, but 
that meant that when Delta hit in June 2021, we probably had to take some of the medicine that we were able to um, avoid last year. Uh, other economies are obviously ahead of us in trying to live with COVID and, and particularly Delta. But hopefully um, as the states plan rolling out, some of that should uh, help our economies, particularly New South Wales and Victoria. Obviously the other states which have applied a different strategy are um, approaching it differently and they're keeping COVID out. But this would indicate that a bounce is very likely. It's just a matter of how quickly and how well it happens in hopefully October, November and December. Uh, in terms of the sustainability of our recovery, the OECD's view is, is that vaccination, obviously rollout is a key and maintaining that. They see a really big issue with China, which I think is logical given the impact that China has had on iron ore prices recently with a lot of those Australian iron ore and other mining entities going from record profits in FY21 to being unable to give any clarity on what's happening in FY22 because pricing's gone through the floor and supply issues around what the demand is. It, it's That's going to be a material issue. And if Evergrande does potentially fall over this week, that could create a real problem in Chinese uh, property, which will then reduce demand further for Australian iron ore because obviously steel in Chinese property, a fair bit of that comes from Australian iron ore. Uh, so drivers of that could have a very big impact. The other issue they saw was productivity. They need, we Australian economy needs to get um, better automation more skilled workforces so they'll be focusing in further uh, higher end skills rather than the basic skills to be able to make everything more efficient and that should also drive some wage growth uh, and wage growth generally drives the economy tax reform i know there's a lot of tax people on here uh, i don't see any issue with a movement away to a higher gst depending upon what the reduction in personal taxes are it might reduce some of the complexity, albeit that there are a number of people who I work with who obviously are specialists in various tax areas who would not like that. But that's a logical position. How that happens politically, who knows? It would appear logically to me that it's only likely if there is a very strong coalition government. Uh, but who knows? The GST was proposed at different stages by Mr Keating and... Uh, so the Labor Party may come back to it. And then the final one is, to, is the biggest and most difficult thing to actually transition across from is how does the Australian economy quantify and focus our climate change risks and response? And that is across, it, it's an economic, it's across the entire economy. We need to actually think about and agree how we're going to transition from one side of mining and coal-fired uh, electricity through to being a climate change um, business effectively because we have the ability to be able to maximise our wind, sun, uh, wave technology and our remoteness into being able to be effectively self-sufficient with a lot of those things and, and minimise our impact going forward. That's going to be difficult from my point of view. Um, gents, do you have any comments on that? I think it's a pretty good yeah, you know, summary of, of, and I think that the hot piece over the top of this is just the uncertainty um, as to what the ongoing impacts of uh, any, you know, social restrictions, um, obviously access and, and movement of people uh, in Australia is, is hugely important and, you know, how long are our borders going to remain uh, closed or restrictions on free travel. And, and I think... That's also, we're seeing that in retail as well, where a lot of the uh, retailers have bought up for Black Friday at the end of November on the basis that supply has been patchy. So they're hoping to have a big Black Friday, but if they can't move that stock, they could be left with excess stock for the next 12 to 18 months. That's good news for people who want to bargain, uh, but it could be difficult for a few of those businesses. So everything's an act of precision at the moment. The one thing I think if you can get a hold of um, wood for uh, in Australia for uh, construction, I think you'd be making a good bit of money at the moment. 
So in summary, we did better than most and we're pretty bouncy. Pre-Delta, we were on the way back up and we were everything was running fairly well. There's a good opportunity for that to, to happen again. Uh, albeit that they're in, in a bouncing economy, there always are some people who just can't get there, but there are some people who make a great opportunity of it. There's plenty of cash around. Um, James is going to talk about that in detail. The fact is, is that there is more than enough money around. And if you, if you look at some of the sales that are going on or potential sales where there's competition at, at over $9 billion for Australian infrastructure assets, it, there is money around for the right type of assets, albeit at the higher end and all the way down. And I think the, the big issue here is, is that staffing will become more important. It'll be maybe more expensive and more difficult to actually manage, but I think it's going to be very important to be able to deliver in a lot of industries in Australia um, and managing that as we um, grow and hopefully the bounce kicks in. So let's get into some questions for our experts. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask them some difficult questions and then I'd hope that uh, some of the other people on our webinar can really put the, uh, the heat on them and get them to answer the questions that they want. So let's talk about the next six months and what things that uh, we can see from each of our experts for, that could benefit our clients. And we'll start at, at the top end and we'll go with Debt Advisory and James the most experienced man. Most you've, amount of grey hair, you mean? <laughs> well, you, you've seen you've seen these types of, like you've seen recoveries before, not this type of recovery, but you've seen this before. So you, you understand what it's probably the approach is going to be. So what's different from last year when there was more uncertainty around these things? What, what has changed? For, for the funding market, there is little doubt that this year is a much better funding market than it was last year. And it might be worth just reflecting on, on what's happened, particularly in the funding market or the lender, lending market. Initially, when the pandemic hit, you know, March last year, banks really retracted from the market. Um, and quite quickly, they took quite large provisions in their, in their P&Ls and balance sheets, expecting losses through the pandemic. Uh, they deferred dividends. Um, and then their customers, their consumers and businesses that bank with them um, really went into more of a saving mode than a spending mode. And their bank balance sheets really through the course of last year ballooned with cash. Um, they were also supported by the government uh, with cheap money. And then the government and the economy was well supported by things by such as JobKeeper and, and, and other things. So. By the time we came to the end of last year, where basically the economies were, local economies were opening back up, banks were flush with cash. So they entered the beginning of this year with the willingness to lend. And um, I, in my whole financing career, have never quite seen the likes of that first six months of 2021. And I think if you were in the market, a good solid credit looking for money, you could possibly have gotten the best deal you could have ever have gotten. Um, and I certainly was in the market in a, on a few occasions and was completely surprised with how cheap the money I could secure for people, particularly for businesses and for larger amounts. Well, when, you, when you're talking about interest rates, which start with a one and then just have yeah. a, a just no, no zero and no nothing behind it on very large assets, that's it's, it, it, you can understand why people were just borrowing willy-nilly a little bit to be able to acquire assets if they could find them. Yeah, so, so they are keen to lend. There's no doubt about that, but we have now gone into a further you know, lockdown environment, um, which has led to a level of conservatism. But underscoring that is that the banks are still very flush with cash. They haven't had the losses they were expecting. Um, they're going to be doing buybacks and other things like that to probably use some of that money, but they're still very keen to lend um, in really all markets, overlaid with a level of conservatism just right now. And obviously rates aren't going to go anywhere for a little while. Well, the Reserve Bank keeps saying um, that, you know, they don't really want to do anything with rates until 2023. Um, fixed rates 
most recently have started to edge up. So this is out to the four and five year period, but ultimately at the, the variable end of the market, it is, you know, it is still low and looking to stay that way for some time. Um, so, yeah. so in terms of that, what is there any difference from the pandemic last year in the residential and commercial markets or are they relatively consistent, a bit more positive now they're willing to look yeah, at well, it as more of a pragmatic way? Yeah, from February, they were really quite pragmatic um, and almost, you know, we're willing to ignore 2020. So for businesses, if they were performing well before 2020 and 2019, they'd look at to those results versus looking at the 2020 results to assess the, their ability to service a loan, for example. Um, and then, you know, there were some banks in the market that found that their balance sheets had gone backwards and <laughs> were wanting to grow that back. So they did release, you know, credit policies, if you like, that were were very favourable, um, um, you know, considering what we'd been through last year. Um, the residential market has just gone from strength to strength through this whole period, probably surprising some. Um, and as long as you meet the consumer lending requirements, which are fairly, you know, strict um, from the banks, but if you meet those requirements, then uh, there is little doubt that the residential market at the moment is probably the hottest it's ever ever been from a funding perspective, let alone a buying perspective. Um, and, you know, really, if you had done a residential deal a couple of years ago, the level of competition that's in that market right now, let's face it, many of the banks are much simpler businesses today than they what they were three or four years ago. They've sold off a lot of other areas of their business and lending in both the residential and commercial markets is now definitely their core. So those are the areas that they have to grow if they want to, you know, grow their bottom lines. So. Cause the only, the only bits that I've heard of concern is, is that there's an oversupply of units in central Melbourne and that's led to a significant downgrade in valuation. And they're, they're the ones that they're sort of watching that they're being careful around that, but everything else is like, well, if valuation steps up, or it's fine. Yeah, every every lender sort of has a a postcode, if you like, uh, rule book, um, so that if you're looking to buy something in certain postcodes, then you know there may be a little bit more restriction in the lending, like a lower, they max out. Yeah, a lower low, loan to value ratio or something like that. Um, but even the the Sydney city market, um, which has you know not performed as well as you know, other parts of Sydney, for example, um, you know, it, it hasn't gone backwards. It just hasn't gone forwards. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, in terms of the support mechanisms, I mean, I know there's approximately 55, 56,000 people or uh, borrowers who are at the moment on deferral deals or whatever else. What, what are the support mechanisms the banks are, are coming to or will provide out of lockdown? Um, yeah, you're right. There's, um, certainly a lot of support mechanisms that were in place last year was heavily used. Um, in fact, some of the banks just put people on the support, even if they didn't want to be. Um, and then you almost had to apply to get off it. Uh, whereas now, as we've entered this current lockdown, it went from a very low base. It almost got back to, you know, a normal level, if you like. But through July, through August, um, and likely September, October, you know, it's gone from very low numbers to probably well over 100,000, both consumers and or businesses that will be on mainly a deferral of interest or, or payment mechanism. Um, it is not difficult to get those still with the banks. Last year, they were offering them for six months and then rolling them over. Right now, it's probably every two or three months but then you've got to go reapply again. So they've shortened that period, but getting them is not, not necessarily that difficult um, if, if, they're ne if they're needed and required. And there's a good story. Yeah, yeah. Because a, a lot of those I assume is a um, timing e episode. It's where there is government support that probably hasn't been received yet, but they need to max, minimum, hold on to whatever cash they have to be able to keep the business alive while the government support comes through and then the business yeah. starts again. And you got hospitality. 
Now, I'm sure we've got people on the line that have applied for New South Wales government support and they've been approved for it. And like one of my customers, it was about 10 grand a month and I think it's about 80 grand they're owed. Haven't been paid it yet. So. <laughs> I'm, happy to, I'm happy to sign a consent to act if they need to go and wind them up. <laughs> um, um, yeah, but other mechanisms, and there is an interesting one at the moment, one that I have a transaction that I've lodged with um, a couple of major banks right now is that the government is looking to support uh, the banks with a coming out of pandemic loan, if you like, uh, and these are for businesses that turn over less than 250 mil, so quite a sizable business, um, and for loan sizes up to 5 million. And the government is looking to guarantee um, the banks for up to 80% of the loan that they will consider granting. There was a, a scheme last year for up to 250,000, so quite a small loan. I don't know if anyone on the line managed to or look to apply for one of those, but they were extremely difficult to get. I certainly looked to get some for some people and it was not a simple process. So now that the loans are bigger and everything else, I'm told that it is easier, but I have one deal that is lodged for 3 million that I believe is a customer that's a perfect fit for the need. Um, um, affected by the pandemic, they've been on JobKeeper and other gov government support mechanisms through the whole period. They do need to buy stock and ramp up again as we head into next year, and they need 3 million to do that. So I believe it's a perfect case. The forecasts all look good. They're making money right now um, and should continue to make money as we come out of the lockdown. So we'll see. I'll come back and revert. <laughs> and that sounds, that sounds like a better solution than say like a debtor finance solution, which is more expensive or could be more expensive and might, might help with growth, but might not necessarily yeah. ride out very well if it's up and down and a bit uncertain over the next few months. That's right. And look, if I'm successful with this, the, the deal is, okay, it does get secured over the business and with director's guarantees. Um, but it comes in as a lump sum. So, uh, you know, the 3 million will come in now. Uh, you can get six months to 12 months interest only, and you then have to repay that loan over the, the term agreed by the bank, but no more than 10 years. So it's quite, you know, they're looking for working capital funding, but, funding, but that's a really flexible way of getting it. Yeah. Um, when in reality, you'll probably get it, and then in two years' time, you go back to the normal type of funding if things continue hmm. to go well. But we'll see. We've had these before and they've been difficult to get, but I think I'm hoping that this will be something that will work. Hmm. And, and just so we close off, so when should a business be looking at their finance needs in the current market? I know you're probably going to say <laughs> all the time, but is, is now a good time for a good business to be, to be having another look at their finance? Look now, and I guess as we now come out of lockdown, um, like it was extremely good up until June. We're now in lockdown, so banks are a little bit more conservative. But if 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 you were to approach the debt market towards the end of this year, it is a great time, in my view, and probably one of the best times for a long time um, to get to get good uh, facilities in place at a very reasonable cost. Um, and you might, and I've been surprised at the, how reasonable that cost has been over the last few months. Even just to keep your current banker honest. Yeah, well, sometimes it's your current banker that fights the hardest. All right, thanks, James. We'll come back to you at different stages when when you we need you to throw a couple of grenades at the other guys. We'll, <laughs> move, we'll move into into Guesty. Um, so, corporate advisory, Nick. Despite all this uncertainty around the return to work and Delta and whatever else, corporate advisory workflow across all the firms that I've been dealing with has been strong, even to the fact where some people have been turning away work at different stages. And that's from the middle market all the way up to large transactions. And we talked about the $9 billion competing offers for an infrastructure asset. Then you've got Sydney Airport being under multiple offers. Um, why do you think there are more transition, uh, transactions this year rather than last year? On the timing, so this year versus last year, um, I think for, on a 
on a global context, which obviously supports some of the larger transactions, uh, is, is global funding. There's a, particularly North America and Europe, um, living with COVID, um, sort of returning to understanding how deals can be completed um, within uh, a restricted um, environment, and but also confidence that, uh, or, or can emerging and, and probably strengthening confidence around uh, the, the good businesses and that you know, transactions will need to be completed um, sort of prop up um, some aspect of it. On the, on the value side, and, and probably similar to, to what James was, was, was talking about, there's, there is a lot of debt around and, and um, access to, to cash um, is, is, is available and pretty cheap. Um, so I think that's driving some of the confidence in the bidding um, for some of these assets. Um, and there's probably a little bit of pent up um, demand as well for, you know, from a, a period of time when there, there were fewer transactions. Um, which is sort of coming through uh, now. Um, so, so does that correlate with the fact that people are looking at growth as easier to acquire than build themselves at the moment as well? I think in, in some aspects it, it, it is easier to acquire. We, we've acted for um, a, a number of offshore uh, acquirers who are keen to enter into the Australian market and under uh, maybe normal terms that they, they may have looked to... to um, to, to come into Australia and set up uh, a presence um, themselves. But with the border restrictions, it, there, there's some advantages to being able to acquire a, a local business and with a you know, ready available labour force and, and market presence uh, to support that, that uh, expansion. Um, and again, coming back to the, the cost of capital and being able to, to deploy that and, and get a return, um, acquiring uh, yeah, uh, in, in trade acquisition can, can look pretty pretty attractive, um, particularly around uh, cost of customer acquisition, um, which we're seeing um, some in the sort of the e-commerce space uh, where the, 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 the cost of um, you know, natural customer acquisitions are, are going up because of the demand um, from e-commerce advertisers and, and the like, the actual marketing costs, um, uh, 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 the rates are increasing quite dramatically. Uh, so again, being able to acquire an assembled customer base uh, is pretty attractive um, where there's some synergies with, with the existing business. And, and Ashi, yeah. I assume in, in, from your client base, one of the other issues why a sale comes through is because they need to take that next step. So they need to either borrow or invest to be able to take that next step for the growth aspect that Nick's talking about. And they would rather, well, a, a simpler opportunity is for somebody to, to sell out. Like if you look at Stone yeah. and Wood, Stone and Wood were trying to raise $50 million, instead decided to sell the line. Yeah, I, th I, think, I think what's important is when you're coming to that decision, modelling out, I guess, the different scenarios. And often you find that the business could get to where they want to get to, you know, in a certain time frame, but it's, it's, you know, they might be too old to actually achieve that and they want it a lot quicker. So they, they'll consider, okay, maybe we do a sale or maybe we do a merge to actually get to that destination a bit quicker. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and guest does is that where private equity also plays in? I mean, are they being active and, and are they coming in to help with that growth play to transition those businesses up? Um, yes, yeah, so you know, private, the private equity funds are still sitting on uh, quite a lot of dry, dry powder, um, and that's both at the, the, you know, the global and um, you know, quite significant uh, um, size transactions. Um, but coming down into the mid-market space as well, yes, um, absolutely, and um, always on the lookout for, for good, profitable um, businesses, and you know, they're prepared to, to support those. Um, even to the extent now we're seeing more um, businesses coming through from the, the venture um, space, which were um, you know, historically um, sort of funded and may have had taken a route towards um, sort of a public markets listing or the like. Uh, there, there's, there's some more transactions where we call the secondary trans transactions where they're being acquired uh, by a larger, um, maybe more diverse or um, you know, private equity fund or other uh, private investors. And there seems to be a bit of 
private equity trend uh, selling to each other as well at the moment is just swapping assets and closing funds and rebuilding funds and whatever else. Yeah, and, and again, I think when when some of those assets um, may need a, um, access to, to debt as well, um, they, they, you know, it comes back to... To, to, to James' comments, um, some of the, the major banks, there's a willingness to, to provide that um, debt finance if it's needed, in addition to the, I guess, the private equity, um, you know, sitting there that's, that's waiting to be deployed. Um, so further on that, what type of industries and asset classes seem to be in the hot areas? I know you have a keen interest in renewables and that conversion industry across. Um, there's plenty of funding going into that. Is that one of the hot areas? Um, it, it is in its, its own right. Um, I think, you know, particularly in, in Australia, um, there's, there's a continuing and growing focus on the renewable sector. Um, we've got you know, great access to the natural resources to, to support uh, those technologies. Uh, for a long time, we've had brilliant um, you know, scientists and engineers in, in that space. Um, I think there's now sort of a growing um, you know, social interest in, in, in uh, the renewable sector as well, which is, is now being backed up by uh, sort of the big investment funds coming, coming into it. Um, from an ESG perspective, we're seeing some of the, the larger corporates um, coming under pressure from, uh, say, some of the big super and other um, you know, ethical funds around the, what assets are in their, their uh, part of their portfolio. Um, so we do expect there'll be some divestments um, or continued divestments from, from some of the larger corporates of potentially assets which um, may, may be still be great profitable aspect, assets, um, but may, may find themselves being considered non-core um, or not fitting with the, the, the sort of the global uh, governance policies. Um, which might find themselves um, moving out to, to private hands where, where they can be, um, you know, continue to run profitably. Um, so that's one area. Um, from the, you know, through, through the market, um, particularly in sort of the SME space, uh, a lot of interest um, across the board, uh, sort of service um, style businesses, um, whether that be uh, into, um, uh, you know, there's not, Sorry, this is the caveat, the non, non retail or, or, or sort of B2C um, services. Um, so, B2B style service businesses, uh, it's been a, a, a lot of demand. Um, so, uh, and we, we're also seeing in um, sort of technology focused um, anything uh, around uh, software um, is, is strong. And, and in supply chain, uh, so particularly around um, warehousing, uh, supportive of e-commerce uh, product movements, uh, a, a lot of a lot of demand uh, in those areas as well. So really quite across the board. Uh, obviously, the sort of the big caveats at the moment um, still around tourism uh, or any tourism exposed businesses, as well as um, some of the hospitality will continue to be um, un under some pressure, but but hopefully. Uh, with particularly in the New South Wales context of, of some opening up or relaxation of the social restrictions, we'll, we'll hopefully see some of those uh, businesses be able to reopen and come back online uh, within to sort of 2022. So, loaded question. You, you, you talked about tech and fintech. Um, some of the fintechs are getting based off revenues rather than profitability, obviously, right? So. I mean, Afterpay lost over 100 million last year, but is being bought for 39 billion. Um, is the boom in tech stocks going to continue as our lives become more automated, and and or is it just a, there's a, also an issue around consolidation where all the big boys gradually seem to buy up anything that looks like it could be the next large product. Um, the valuation part is is really challenging and I don't think anyone will propose to, to know exactly what drives some of the, some of those valuations um, I think what is called greed positive, yeah or fear of missing out um, and I, I think that that really does drive some um, some investor actions what is positive uh, for, I think from the afterpay and, and maybe even the canvas story um, so both um, ASX listed um, uh, or exposed to the public markets is that it's a growing awareness of this strength of the Australian um, fintech and, and technology uh, markets. 
so we've seen a, a lot of, or, or I guess, greater investor interest and knowledge around the Australian um, markets, whether that be the ASX and the strength of the ASX, or just the, the fintech operations and, and technology more widely uh, within the Australian um, context. So it doesn't answer the, the pure valuation piece, and, and I think you, you know, have to look at that a little bit more uh, closely as to, to why. Um, what why? You know, I'm glad. I'm glad it's not my money. I'm glad it's not my money. Yeah, but but I do believe that there, you know, fintech or tech, as whether it be um, sort of regulatory tech or uh, tech enabled. You know, e-commerce or supporting remote working or anything like that um, will continue to have a, a, a larger um, market share and market presence for, for some time to come because it, it really is supporting the way that we're um, operating and, and sort of living our lives at the moment. All right. Thanks, Kesti. I'll move on to Ashi and get into some uh, business advisory. And you work primarily with family business clients, some of which are shooting the lights out right now mm. need to need some more money to be able to borrow or to be able to expand. Yeah. So what are you seeing with your clients and what has the impact this year been compared to last year? Yeah, I, th I think both, both this year and last year, I think the, the industry you're in, I guess your, your geographic location and what stage you are, I guess, in your life cycle has had a, you know, a significant impact on, on how you're performing. Um, I think some businesses have had it had it really tough, um, but I think overall, um, most businesses that I'm speaking to at the moment are, are pretty optimistic about the future. Um, especially as there's you know there's more talk about about things opening up, which is which is positive. Um, at the start of the pandemic last year, we we actually did a survey, and the the overwhelming response uh, that we got from businesses at the time was that. Uh, long-term planning was their, their highest priority. And I actually don't think that's changed from last year. I think that's still the same. Um, but I do think that business owners are still struggling to, to make decisions um, on what to do to move forward. Um, I think like last year, a lot of people are, are pretty tired. You know, there's been a sustained period of, of I guess, uncertainty. And that's, that can be quite exhausting. Um, so while I think people want to plan for the future, I think they're struggling to do that. Um, I think the uncertainty and the complexity can be a bit overwhelming. Um, That's where so they should talk to you though, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. yeah a, sh a shameless plug. Um, so yeah. So I mean, yeah. So for most business owners, I've, I've been working with them on that particular point. So really break down your, your decisions into into bite-sized pieces on, on, on what you can control. Um, because if you focus on, on all the noise, you, you're gonna drive yourself crazy. So, you know, take a methodical approach, focus on what you can control and actually, you know, start ticking them off one by one. I think that's, I think that's the key, to be honest. So, so your clients are, are dealing with it differently by breaking that down. And I assume that's also driven, they've had to actually adjust their decision-making process because they're not just in the office being able to look at all the data. Mm. Um, they've have to actually be able to run the business based off more factual sort of things that they can get their hands on. Has that led them to being able to make better decisions and run their businesses better? So is there been some automation come through and all of those things to help them do that, to run their businesses more remotely? Yeah, definitely. I think I think the the pandemic's um, given a lot of business owners an opportunity to think slightly differently. Um, they've been forced into to working from home, and I think that's been quite a, a positive thing for a lot of people. Um, there's been a lot of, I guess, old school businesses that I've worked with for, for many many years, and the idea of working remotely or or, or using technology the way that we're using it was never was never in their, I guess, their frame. Um, we, have, now we have partners who are still in that sort of mentality. But, but they're, forced, they're forced now to actually use it and, and they're actually starting to come around to, to some of the benefits, which is, you know, it's great. It's good to see. It's good to see. Um, I think also, you know, with the fact that it's going to be harder to find, to find staff, I think you, utilising your, your, um, your digital capabilities more is going to be really important. Um, and you've got to make your business attractive for, I guess, the next generation that's coming through. And a lot of them have spent, 
you know, the people in year 12, they've spent their entire life, well, you know, their most critical two years in, in lockdown doing everything remotely. So when they come into the workforce, this is what they're going to expect. So um, I think it's an opportunity. You, you fill me with concern with that comment, but okay. Um, <laughs> what, are, what are the, what's working for the clients in positive territory compared to those that aren't doing as well? Are they adapting better? Yeah, so I think the ones that are in positive territory are really not letting, I guess, the complexity and the uncertainty get in the way of them making decisions. So, um, you know, at, at the start of last year, I think we're all trying to get our heads around the situation. Um, but I think at the, at the start of this year, I think we're all used to the current situation. Um, now, it's, now it's a matter of, okay, what do we have in front of us and what can we actually do? Um, what can we actually start to do, actually making decisions? Um, and for a lot of, I guess, my more mature business clients, so ones that have gone through the, 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 the growth phase and are now in that succession phase, um, succession has been a real key, a key goal for them. Um, and I think the ones that have actually kept, kept planning uh, their succession, progressing on their succession, I think have performed better. Um, I think that I think that ongoing planning process, and then also getting the the different perspective of the new generation, I think has been a real positive for them. So, um, so I, I I think that's going to become even more important over the next year 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 and two, is that succession piece. So that along with staffing issues. Mm. Is that going to be, is, is that what their uncertainty is for the next few months around as the reopening comes through, around how big the bounce will be for them on an individual basis? Is that the sort of constrictions? Is, is it where they are in their industry, what staffing they have and how well they've adapted to be able to maximise the bounce? Yeah, I, th I think I think that's, that's spot on. I mean, like I said before, you know, geographic location and, you know, stage in the life cycle and industry, um, you know, businesses are different, so they're going to face, you know, face different challenges. Um, but I, but I think that the staffing piece is going to be across the board um, a challenge. Um, and I think succession and working that through is is going to be another challenge. I think if you leave that piece of the puzzle too late, um, you know, you know, it, it just becomes very difficult. You know, it takes it takes years to do succession. It, it, it's not a it's not a let's do it at 30 June type um, process. So, yeah. yeah it's, it's always better to have a strategy and a plan so that then you mm. can adapt it rather than just hoping to be able to put it together as the plane's taking off, the old adage. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Yep. All right. Thanks, Ashi. Uh, we'll move on to, um, to Hawk and restructuring. Something very close to my heart. Matt. Uh, can I get your views on how businesses can manage the uncertainty of the, the vaccine rollouts and when they're coming back to the office and what changes will occur as Sydney opens over the next six months? I guess when it comes to the vaccine rollout or, or probably more importantly, um, actually you know, implementing your plan to come back to work and, and, and reopening, um, you know, it, it seems to be there's a lot of unknowns legally, you know, ethically and, and morally around this new concept of, of how to deal with the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. Um, you know, and you know that going through dealing with your customers, dealing with your employees, and, and dealing with your suppliers. Um, I, you've probably seen, you know, from from yesterday that that the Victorian when, construction when, industry, <laughs> when 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 a government um, makes a decision that they're going to just you know draw a line in the sand and say you know what this particular part of of the population needs to be vaccinated that that you get a quite a strong uh, response and polarizing views in the community you know I guess we can we can argue all day whether or not it's you know there there was those people that are protesting are are in that industry or not I think that the important thing is that you know there are people in the community that that don't share views around vaccination or, or want the freedom to choose. Um, so that's going to be very, very difficult for businesses to reopen and, and not having clarity from government um, makes life very, very hard. So, you know, what, what should you do around that issue? I guess follow the guidance from Fair Work, follow the, the other guidance of, of that's been published by government. 
um, take legal advice where you think you need to. Um, although I wouldn't expect that legal advice would give you a clear way forward. It might tell you what not to do, what's illegal. Um, but um, it really is an unknown around, around how to do with it. So I think those are the two things that, that, that you should do when you're, you're coming up with your procedures and processes around returning to work and the safety and health of your customers, employees and other stakeholders. So, so understand it, let it evolve, and then gradually um, well, allow, you, allow your strategy to, to adapt as the things evolve. It's awesome than the car. I mean, it's, it'll, be, it'll be good for some that can wait for, for others in business to make decisions, but there will be, have to be some businesses that will, will have to take the lead. Um, and, you know, it's probably very easy for a Qantas to, to make that decision because they just see it as a, as a help um, position, and that'll be that. Um, there'll obviously probably be some, some, some court action around, around, you know, the implementation of this type of stuff. Um, and, you know, ideally, you can let someone else <laughs> lead the way and make the decision. Um, but it may be that you just have to have to take the advice and, and, and do what you think is right. But, but as Ashi was suggesting, being able to have your strategy, understand what your strategy is and then and, and implement it so that it actually makes sense is important so that you've got clarity on your decisions. Well, so, because, uh, yeah, otherwise you can just go, well, I've got to wait, I've got to wait, I've got to wait, I don't know, and things can move past you. I mean, so, in respect of some of the other issues, I mean, I, I'm – take my, my um, pessimistic cap off today. And I picked A in, in that first survey. I, I think that the, the rebound will be strong. I don't um, believe you. I don't believe you. <laughs> yeah, I know it's pretty rare that I do. Um, but, you know, I think, I, think, I think from a lot of those sectors that have been highly impacted, um, you know, especially in, in retail and hospitality and, and um, restaurants and pubs, um, I think November, December, as things start to reopen, as long as the government sticks to, to their plan um, that they've, they've outlined, um, will be very strong and, and they will actually find that GDP um, will, be, will, will be quite good and, and we'll, we will rebound strongly from the September quarter, although we don't have those results yet. And, I mean, obviously there'll be opportunities there because there will be some businesses which don't recover. Um, and we often find that in a recovery period that we are busier doing restructures than we are in a recessionary period or a declining period. So, but what does the look, what does the restructuring landscape look like now? And do you expect that uptick of insolvencies over the next few months? Or? I mean, that, that's, that's 100% right. I mean, it's not, it's not always about recessions for there, there to be more insolvencies. Um, volatility can cause... Um, People just to get it wrong just by, the, by the nature of, of, of you know, you, you're chasing the carrot. Um, insolvencies have to pick up because they're at historically low levels. Will they pick up, you know, reflecting said, that? The said like a man who just got his liquidation ticket. <laughs> um, will they pick up to reflect the, the economy? No, I think it will be still be very, very flat. Um, I, I think possibly as things return to normal um, in 2022, things things will go back to normal and, and we'll, we'll get the same amount of insolvencies that we always have gotten over the last five years. Um, you know, in, in respect of, of restructuring and, and, and reviewing your position as a business, you know, now is a great time to take stock of your business, implementing, implement restructuring plans um, and, and go and communicate with your stakeholders if you need you know, further debt. Um, it, it, you know, the, the, as Nick said, the M&A space is, is strong. So, Now's the time to, if, if you need further capital or you want a business partner, that, that you can sell part of your business and, and um, onwards and upwards. And so, solve the problem by a sale or a transaction rather than having mm. to go through the, the pain of, of insolvency. And the ATO's part of that, the ATO is paused. Uh, when do you think ATO will stop being as accommodating as they are at the moment? Because um, eventually, well, eventually we've got to pay for this. We've got to pay for the... Um, the job keeper and all of the support. Do you though? <laughs> I don't know. The government um, can't just the government just can't keep printing money. We're not like Argentina well, from the eighties. When you look at the United States, I don't know if that's true, but um, look, I, I think the ATO, as we all all were seeing, we're, we're starting to to get back into gear mid year, um, following on from from basically. Um, the moratorium on, on enforcement action in, in 2020. Um, 
with this lockdown, I, I, the ATO's current position is that it's not down tools like it was last year, um, but they will be they will be more accommodating and will consider uh, the individual circumstances of each taxpayer. I've been told, um, but that's not to say you know that the taxpayers that had significant issues prior to to the first lockdown in 2020. Um, they still may get a knock on knock on the door, and and, and we'll have to deal with, with those existing tax liabilities. All right, last one, and then we'll get to some questions that we've got. And if anybody else has any questions, please start whacking them into the Q and A box. Um, what are the three things you're advising clients to consider doing over the next few months to prepare for 2022? Um, I think review your business plan and strategy. I mean, COVID really has shown that that. The way that customers behave, and I guess it depends what, what industry you're in, but if we're, we're just looking at, at those highly affected industries um, that, that are you know, direct to the end consumer, the way they behave um, is has changed and certain segments of, of your customer base um, will not behave like they used to. Um, you know, if you look at different examples, we, we dealt with high-end restaurants um, and they were adamant in 2020 that, you know, they would never do takeaway. Um, faced with, with the option of, of either do takeaway or die, they, they chose takeaway. And then things like Provador have now come out from that. Um, and they can be highly effective in for restaurants, for example, um, in that they have they have an order up front, they're able to, to order their stock uh, in advance and, and, and make money that way. And there will be certain customers that will feel uncomfortable going to restaurants for the foreseeable future. And you just don't know, um, I guess, whether or not this is the last lockdown that we'll ever have. It's hard to say. Uh, secondly, you know, the implementation of, of your vaccine policies and procedures, which we discussed earlier. Uh, and if you do have problems and you are carrying debt that you know you have that has eventuated throughout this period, that you know, looking at your restructuring options now, um, it would be the best thing to do. You, you will get. Um, accommodating stakeholders, so you have good relationships with key stakeholders um, that will understand that, that it has been a hard time. Um, and, and given the market when it comes to the availability of credit and, and also the MA market, uh, now's the time to think about it and actually deal with the issues as opposed to just let them get by, you know, roll down the road. Yep. So here's some of the things that we got out of that, out of our discussion and whatever else, which is what some of the recommendations that you should be doing. So looking at economic data and, and contemplating how that'll happen with your business, that's more at a general trend level. Um, monitoring the individual key data. So looking at your sales, your stocks, your costs as the recovery starts to find and, and look for trends. So feel get, take that feel aspect of it. It's the most difficult thing to do, but the best business um, people have a great feel, have a great touch for their business and how it's adapting. Share information and talk to everybody, gather information together and be able to put it all into a mixing pot and assess it on a, uh, on a consistent basis. So you can actually not relying on one source to be able to say, well, that's right, that's wrong. Um, that's something that I think is more difficult while everybody's in lockdown, but will hopefully will become more um, logical and plan. Have, a, have an overall strategy about what you want to do or at least hold everything together. And so that as information and issues arise, you can adapt and, and adjust to it, but have an overall ideology about where you are trying to get to. Glenn's asked, so what am I defining a bounce? Um, I look at it as a GDP and a general economic increase without the government impact or with only um, a minimal impact. So it is probably GDP. Mark's asked, James, what do you think will happen with the US dollar AUD exchange rate? I know the dollar's going through the floor at the moment because iron ore is going down. I don't even think economists know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Look, I, there's little doubt that the Aussie dollar is going to be impacted by what's going on in China um, and how that plays out. But to what extent, uh, you know, who knows? <laughs> don't know. And, and then you've got the other factor over the top is, is that whether um, when we open the borders, whether that creates a desire for Australian dollars as well. Mm. Well, we are, you know, in the top 10 trade, most traded currencies. So Yeah, because we're right. a commodity player, right? That's right. And, but it often means that people are playing with our currency at the detriment <laughs> to our price, but. 
it's a very hard one to predict the Aussie dollar. Um, and then Mark's also asked that I'd, I asked, I'd spoke about the higher GST and a lower personal tax, which the OECD recommended. Um, would there be a benefit of companies sitting on substantial franking credits out of that? Uh, there may well be, but as we've seen with the change in the tax rate for companies as well, that created a unique scenario where people had to get franking credits out at higher rates um, because it was going to create a problem for them when it moved from 30 cents to uh, 27 cents. So, yeah, well, I, I could see there could be a movement there um, and it'll just have to be how they bring it in and what happens at that point.